Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the headlines. I'm your host, Margaret Matibiri. And today on the show, we're joined by National Constitutional Assembly President, Professor Lavo Maduku. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Professor, can you tell us more about your political party? Uh, the NCA is a political party that was formed in 2013 as a political party. But before that, it was a civic organization that was campaigning for a new democratic and people-driven constitution. But then we believe in social justice. Uh, we believe in a, what we call a social, democratic, political, and economic setup. We were dissatisfied with the existing political parties, and we believed that they were not championing what we believed in. So we, 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 we know that you have a strong background in the legal arena, and you're a professor in that, in that respect. So can you, can you tell us more on the legal side of it, on the way that things are being run politically in the country? Well, I would tell you politically, of course, there would be legal implications mm -hmm. uh, as well. I think first and foremost, uh, one of the issues coming up is that we have had an election. We had an election in July mm -hmm. 2018. Uh, legally, that election is over. So if you want from the legal side, uh, the election is over. You have a president. You may be happy or unhappy with him, but there is a president. And then legally, you have now to work towards ensuring that uh, there is delivery. Uh, the country must be governed in such a way that you have the economic, political situations in settled. We are, of course, unhappy with so many reports coming up of um, human rights abuses, etc. But we think that those kind of situations must be resolved by people continuing to talk about them. Okay. So, obviously, you are well versed in, in, in these matters um, regarding the challenging of the election results. And we have had that uh, the matter was taken to court and the world uh, witnessed that and the Constitutional Court made a ruling to that if that President Minangago was, was the winner. But then, as a political leader, well, what is your stance on, on the way the, the Constitutional matter was handled? Uh, I, I should be very clear. As a political leader, the Constitutional matter was handled in accordance with the way the Constitution says it must be handled. Mm -hmm. The Constitution says that if you are not happy with an election result mm -hmm. and you were a candidate in that election, you go to a court called the Constitutional Court. Mm -hmm. And then you must go to that court within seven days of your uh, the result being announced. And then within 14 days, that court must make a decision. That's what happened. Uh, we, we are not there to say did the judges decide correctly or not. Mm -hmm. we, the Constitution says that that decision is made by the judges of the Constitutional Court. It is not for anyone else to make. So I, I would say that the decision was made. We shouldn't even be commenting about the merits or demerits of the decision. What we must know is that the constitutional system is working. It worked. Uh, we have a result that came from the constitutional court. That is all for us at this as political leaders. Yeah, we are just laymen in this field, and you happen to be the gurus in the field. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. So, uh, recently, I made aware that you received... Uh, an invitation for a meeting by the president where you called upon all leaders of political parties to come forward so that they can put forward um, their position on what they expect before dialogue can 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 take place. Can you can you take us through that? Yes, it is correct that uh, we received a letter. Mm -hmm. We received the letter at the NCA. What the president invited, he invited every political party that had a presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. So as the NCA, we fell into that category of political parties that had a presidential candidate. Our understanding of the invitation was uh, we are Zimbabweans, you are politicians, we were in the contest together, I was elected president, you didn't get elected, but I would need to hear from you from time to time. And let's come together and discuss how best we can from now on be interacting. The president who is in office and other politicians who are not in office. The idea is to create a situation in Zimbabwe where those politicians that succeed in going into parliament, going into councils, going into the presidency, would still be able to interact with the politicians that are outside those things. Okay. And that's how we, we took it and we accepted that invitation. We went to the meeting. Okay. So we, we have seen other political players uh, bailing on that. What, what would be your comment? Considering that I, 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 in my personal view, would think that this was an arena to address 
or issues that might have arisen from the period where the elections were held and the contestations and everything that came forward. Well, what would be your comment? Well, I think first and foremost, you we must understand that we are different political parties. Mm -hmm. And people are in different political parties because of different political views. We look at things differently. Uh, we as the NCA would not have any problem with uh, talking to any other Zimbabwean. And if that person who is wanting to talk to us is the president of the country who we, whom we know has a, a bearing on the day-to-day -day decisions that are taken and that affect the life of everyone, we would think that uh, you, you should be in a position. There's no harm in talking to that person. But other political parties think differently. But I know the reason why the some political parties might think differently. There are political parties that believe that dialogue, that's the term that is used, is a state of affairs where you discuss with the person who is in power to replace them. To say, you are in power. I want to dialogue with you so that you get out of power. Or I want to dialogue with you so that I share the power that you have. Those are the two options that they have. Either they get into dialogue to ensure that uh, they replace the president, or get into dialogue to share power with the president. That's their understanding. We understand that. But this invitation was not about that. The invitation was not about come to me so that you discuss how to replace me. Come to me so you discuss sharing power with me. It was come, no, come to me so we share bread. Exactly. <laughs> come to me so I could try and see how far we can discuss. We believe that um, opposition political parties have a role to play. And there are two types of opposition political parties. There is the political opposition political party that is in parliament. And there's an opposition political party that is outside parliament. We as the NCA, we are a political party that is outside parliament. We do not have the parliamentary platform to be able to express the views that. So the only platform we have is a platform, the one that was given by the president. So we will, we will be very foolish not to take it up because we have no other platform. But these are the political parties that say that we are not going to dialogue with the president. They are actually misleading everyone because every day they are in parliament dialoguing with the president and his ministers. And therefore, all what they're saying is they don't want dialogue where others are, are, also, are involved. also involved. I mean, that's the message is very clear. Yeah, that's, and, that's very insightful. Yes. So, uh, we are sure that it was a closed door me meeting because uh, the media was excused when, when, when the talks began. What, what were your prerequisites for a conducive environment for dialogue? Well, we made it clear that um, there will be two things. First, that uh, there is no precondition. Okay. Um, you would not put preconditions. Mm -hmm. Everyone who wants to talk come. But the, that no precondition to dialogue also meant that there will be no preconditions to matters on the agenda. Okay. So the, the, every item that anyone wants to put on the agenda will be part of the agenda. Okay. So that is the how it, it then fits in. That was the most important decision. No precondition on condition that there will also be no precondition to agenda. the agenda. So, for example, if I take uh, my colleagues uh, who did not come, who believe that the agenda must constitute something to do with the legitimacy of the president, they are free to put that issue on the agenda. No issue will be taken up. So if they believe that the president must not be the president, let them bring it, let it be debated within the framework. But then yeah. is there a higher law that can argue that position, that the president should stand down? Well, what I could say is that if that matter is put on the agenda, mm -hmm. then answers will be given by different players. Okay. Say, well, this is what we think. I wouldn't want to preempt that discussion. But surely we should not stop a person coming in and say, although we had an election, mm -hmm. although we had a constitutional court ruling, I still feel that the president must not be there. I mean, they also, I'm sure they will say, he must not be there, I must be there. There will be questions to be raised, because the only person whom we can call president, at least, not just me, but everyone else. You can only call a person president of Zimbabwe if that person has been pronounced president by the electoral processes mm -hmm. and has been confirmed if there is a challenge. You can never be the president of Zimbabwe unless an electoral process in terms of the law of Zimbabwe has declared you president. So, as a political candidate and as a presidential candidate at the same time, you did have your, your goals on what should become of Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe that you had in mind. What do you think is the way forward for Zimbabwe economically, 
politically from where we stand right now because we seem to be in a dark place. Yes, I think the first thing from the kind of vision that I share and what the NC share, elections are over. Mm-hmm. That is our first point. Mm-hmm. And that elections will be held every five years. They come and go. And so we're ready election. The election in has been perfect. We will make the next election more perfect or at least better. That's well, all. I think that would also come in through the, this the engagement, yes. But in between the election, the primary focus must be on the welfare of the people, mm-hmm. the state of the economy, and then raising the state standard of life of our people. Mm-hmm. But to do that, you need to engage those who are in government. So give them your ideas and comment, make them accountable. They must lay out what their vision is, what their agenda is for the country, because they are the ones that are in government. And then we must comment on it and say, I think this policy is one that is causing more problems than, than, uh, than solutions. And then with, if they are creating political problems, like in that meeting, a number of our political parties, a number of our colleagues were complaining about the, you know, the involvement of the military in the day-to-day activities. They wanted uh, you know, people to, the government to investigate all these allegations that are being made about the excesses of uh, the security forces rape of women, you know, all these, they, these things. Were, that's the kind of platform we have. So from an economic perspective, it was even suggested, although it was not yet time for dialogue, mm-hmm. to say this one-to-one policy uh, in terms of uh, the value of the bond note, the value of the U.S., one of the political leaders mentioned that and says that that's part of the madness that is causing problems. Mm-hmm. That was his view mm-hmm. and so forth. So my own view and the views of the NCA would be very clear. We would want now to use the period between July 30, 2018 mm-hmm. and sometime in July or August 2023 to be a period where we make the government accountable. It must be made every week, every month to set out the economic target and how they want to do it and for us to comment on that and also to give them ideas on what should happen. That is what ought to happen. And then we must always speak with one voice regarding, you know, uh, the outside world. Yeah. One of those issues that we know are being talked about, and we believe as the NCA, there is no reason why we should continue to have sanctions. I know that there are people that say, and they are entitled to have those different views, that say, look, sanctions are, first some say there are no sanctions, mm-hmm. others say that no sanctions are necessary. But our view is that whatever our problems in this country, it is not desirable for countries outside to still put restrictions, whether those restrictions relate to individuals or not. Because we now know that those things affect the general population. population. And I don't think we would be part of those who say, ah, it doesn't affect the general population, it affects a few individuals. Ah, no, no, we we don't buy that. And that's why we are a different political party. So I've answered your question. The way forward is Zimbabweans must work together and say that the next elections are in 2023. Between now and the next election, to the extent that we can contribute, we are not in government, but I think that as a political party, we have a contribution to make okay. in that. So um, you're, you're talking of the issue of working together. And we, we have seen that there seems to be a great uh, rift in the political arena. And we see that there is a lot of extremism from both those in opposition, those in government, and those in the ruling party as well, and who are not in government. What what would be your comment on the issue of extremism and politics? Yes, I agree that there is um, what we are calling extremism. Some people call it polarization, mm-hmm. where people do not want to listen to an opposing view. Mm-hmm. They think that their point is the correct one, the other point is and so forth. That is obviously wrong. Uh, there can be no absolutely correct position and absolutely wrong position. God created people and men of us, and we have different views, different thought process, etc. I think the way forward is to encourage each other not to take extreme positions. That every individual must have the view that they may be wrong, even if they believe that they are right. And the moment you start to realize that you may be wrong, and that your colleague may be right, you tend to tolerate other views. So I will preach tolerance and I would urge all Zimbabweans in whatever field, whether it be churches, civil society, in our education system, to teach uh, people to realize that absolutism, or what you read, absolute, would not be the correct way to go. You, you may be wrong, 
and that is why Zimbabwe must move forward from there. So I, I, that is my comment. It's a very disturbing view. Uh, you are aware that I was part of the Monsanto Commission. We yes, did yes, observe, we were getting uh, to that. We did observe in that commission, and we made a recommendation that every effort must be made to depolarize mm -hmm. the politics of Zimbabwe. I read one of the newspapers today talking about what they call toxic politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that is correct. Toxic politics is where you keep bringing back and forth those kind of ideas that will destroy you know, society. Uh, you must not look at the, this country as being divided between those who are in government and those who are outside government. There's no such division. Yeah, so, uh, in regards to the issue of the commission, you were one of the commissioners who were chairing that. But there, there, there were people, and some even went to the extent of, of contesting that in, 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 in court over your, 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 your placement in that commission. What, 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 what is your position? Like, you had the opportunity to either give it up or accept the offer. Mm -hmm. why, why did you accept it? I accepted it because I, it was an opportunity to save the country and to make a contribution to my political beliefs. One of the beliefs that I have is that we must start from truth and then we go to justice. Truth and justice move uh, you know, side by side. And in that commission, we had one question which was uh, bothering everyone. Who was responsible for the death of those six people. But then up, up until today, we do not have a clear answer as to who let out those soldiers and who was responsible. Yeah, that was answered. The commission answered. The soldiers and the police uh, were responsible for killing. Obviously, the soldiers and the police were responsible. We and saw them, that, but uh, who gave the order? The, not, there was no order given to kill. The, the, order that was, the, the order that was there was for the army to assist the police and that was given by the president but then up, up until today there, there has not been a follow-up as to why the soldiers shot and killed people well we so what what was exactly the purpose of the of the inquiry if we are going to hear that the soldiers yes they were deployed but then no one told them to shoot and kill then there is footage of them shooting and killing people and yes. nothing happens after that. Yes, that's the responsibility of the government. We gave very clear recommendations, and that recommendation was that there must now be a thorough identification of which of the members of the security, which soldiers shot, and then those must be taken through the normal criminal processes. But then who is responsible to see that those people are brought to book? Because the and That is the role of the president. I mean, it's very clear. I mean, that commission was appointed by the president. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the commission reported to the president. Mm -hmm. and, the and president you were a presidential candidate and you are a legal person. Yeah. Do you not have any role that you can play to assist since you, you, you work with those people firsthand trying to find out what happened? Is there anything else that can be done? Well, yes, there's a lot that can be done, but that, that doesn't just lie on the shoulders of those of us who are legal or political people. The commission that we are referring to, made a report, the report, the president made it public. So mm -hmm. every Zimbabwean has a report mm -hmm. that tells us the soldiers did it. Mm -hmm. They had, the president had deployed the military to assist the police, but the shooting was at the instance of the individual soldiers that were on the ground, and that there must be a process to identify these soldiers and to take them to a criminal process. Now, every Zimbabwean knows that that is what has been recommended. So we must all put pressure on the president to make sure that this happens. I mean, there's no reason to say we don't know what is happening. He, the president knows he's responsible for implementing the recommendation. The president knows that he is ultimately the topmost person in the country who must ensure that. And I have no doubt that it will be done because that is what the commission is all about. Where we have differences with many people is that the time element. The exactly, commission because... Has because the issue of the time element, I think all the parties involved, members of the army in charge of those people who were deployed, could have just been called and an inquiry would have been done on who those specific soldiers are and they would have been brought to book. Yes, but look, the commission reported um, um, to the president in December. Mm -hmm. The report was made public on 18 December. Mm -hmm. It's not two months uh, after that uh, report was made available. It yeah, it's almost two months and yeah, like next week. Next week, exactly. Yes. So what is happening is the debate is whether those recommendations can be implemented within two months. 
I think it's really premature for people to already say that the president will not implement. For me, as a member of that commission, I still have confidence that uh, given the time, I mean, it takes time. I think that. But uh, Professor, those people, those victims, they are they have already rotten in their graves. Is is there is there is there need for a longer period? There is no need for a longer for period for people to to investigate and look into the the the, the vile murder of innocent people. I, I agree with you that it must be treated with agency, mm-hmm. and that uh, agency is not time bound. So whether it's agent in two months or three months or four months or five months, that's where the debate is. And I believe because, that because also I think very soon we'll actually have another commission inquiring on on the January 14, 15, 16 violence because people also died. Well, I don't think they need the commission. They haven't said they will start the commission. I think what this commission did, our commission must not be dilatory. It was the beginning of a society in which people must take responsibility for what they have done. And this responsibility was placed on the shoulders of the army and the police. And then the debate now is whether within two months the president would have implemented all. I don't believe that two months would be a, a fair period to say that all recommendations would have been implemented. I think that uh, people must give the president time. And uh, let's talk about this thing again in three, four, five months. Then at that stage, we believe we would have delayed. So it's a question of distances. I don't believe two months is uh, the kind of time we could have implemented. Yeah, speaking for myself, as a layman, as I have, as I have said before, yeah. I, w- I would believe that it would be necessary for that matter to be dealt with as a matter of agency. But then let's let's talk about the terror that has gripped the general citizens as they are still soldiers manning roadblocks in the country where they demand for identification cards and people are harassed in commuter omnibuses along the ways and people go about looting and this is like they, there's no law, there's no rule of law in the country. Yes, I think we must condemn two things. Mm-hmm. The reaction of the military is excessive. Mm-hmm. That must be condemned. And so we would not want to, to really allow the kind of situation where they terrorize people and so forth. That must definitely be condemned. But we must also condemn with equal measure, the looting of property mm. and so forth. There is a world of difference between a peaceful demonstration mm. and looting property. So we continue to have these two problems that uh, we are confronting. An excessive reaction by the security apparatus. Yeah. And then some unacceptable um, behavior in terms of uh, destroying property and so forth. Those things must uh, not continue. So we must say as citizens, we must commit ourselves to peaceful protest, peaceful expression of our opinions, peaceful ways of doing things. At the same time, we then demand of our security establishment. Not like for now, by now, there should be no reason why the military must still be in the streets. I think the situation is good. Uh, it is back to normal, and there will be no need. We must just go back to the police again on their own, etc. But remember that Zimbabweans uh, must always realize this. They put in the Constitution two, one, section 213 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe. It says that the military may be deployed to assist the police. That is the, the, mm-hmm. we, the people of Zimbabwe, we said that because that Constitution came from a referendum. It says directly the military may be deployed to assist the police. The only condition we gave was that the person who decides whether to deploy the military or not must be the president. But then apparently that 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 has not been followed because the president did not know who had deployed the soldiers. That's not what we found out. I mean, with the commission, the president has he deployed soldiers. But, but and now, even now, the military, which you see, has been deployed by the president. People must not rush and claim that the president did not know. That is not correct. We must he must be accountable. The military has been deployed. Whatever it has done after its deployment. The president must ensure that the military stays within its parameters. But we should not do this uh, thing of saying, ah, the president, who? There is no hand, hidden hand there. The only hand that we know is the hand of the president. And that is what is important. So if the military comes in and is excessive, we must blame both the military and the person who deployed the military. 
So it seems like we're in a dark tunnel at the moment. Like the future seems so bleak with everything that has been going on. What do you think is the way forward moving from where we are, where there is political violence, there is looting, and there is attack on, on, on innocent people by civilians as well. And there's also the attack on innocent people by the soldiers. And there are so many issues of rape, people rushing into safe houses. What, what do you think is the way forward from where we are? Well, first I should say that that is not a permanent state of affairs. Mm-hmm. That is not a Zimbabwe that will remain in that state. So we must ensure that we stop all those things. The starting point is to be hopeful in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe will be a much better place to live in. In the, in the coming years, uh, we have hope for the country. All we have to do is to keep saying what is the kind of Zimbabwe that we want. Now, judging from your questions, it's clear that we are all agreed. We want a Zimbabwe where people live peacefully, where there is economic production and that the life of the people has improved, where the security, ab- uh, security forces do not abuse the state power. And where we as citizens act responsibly, we do not destroy our own property. That's what the Zimbabwe that we want. So let's let's not put a, a, a bleak future for us. We have a very uh, um, progressive future, a very hopeful Zimbabwe that will come as long as we take it upon ourselves to resolve that issue. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining us on the show today. It was a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Professor Maduku saying that Zimbabweans have to introspect on the Zimbabwe that they want and that there was still a lot of hope left for Zimbabwe. I'm Margaret Matibiri signing out.